Hi everyone. I am so excited to share with you my debut picture book. It is The Boy Who Dreamed of Infinity. And it's coming out from Candlewick Press this month. And it's illustrated by Daniel Mieres. And I wish I had his other books to share with you. He has a beautiful book called Float, which I hope you look up and many, many others. Um, but unfortunately, they're locked in my office and because of quarantine, I can't get them. So um, this book is incredibly special to me. It's really a story I've been thinking about my whole life. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to share that backstory with you. But I wanted to give you a little peek inside this book. So here you see the end papers are all of these numbers. Um, and it's called The Boy Who Dreamed of Infinity, A Tale of the Genius Ramanujan. And you see down there, there's a little, you'll see this in the text itself, but there's a little game. And I'm going to be teaching people how to play that game, not in this presentation today, but if you check back at my website, you'll definitely see some instructional materials on that game. And now you see these beautiful drawings. Um, these are called column drawings. And they're actually a traditional form of geometric art that women in South India create um, in the ground in front of their houses with chalk, colored chalk. So they make these beautiful designs. And the artist, Daniel Mieres, did um, a beautiful study of these to prepare for these drawings. He learned how these are traditionally done and I think he's going to do some instructional videos on that so I'll let, stay tuned for that as well okay so I'm just gonna read you the first few pages so today the world is small with the single click you can see anywhere or speak to anyone but 100 years ago the world was big it took weeks to send a letter by steamer from here all the way to there. Back then, if you had an idea, even a rare and wonderful idea, on one side of the world, people on the other side might never know. Your ideas might stay forever where they began, right here. In a small village in South India, by the banks of the Kaveri River, in Amma's arms. And I'm just gonna let you enjoy the magic of that moment without reading this page. So he hears about a mysterious dream in that page, but I'm not gonna read it to you right now. For three years, he stayed quiet as a mouse. Chinniswami, my little lord, Amma begged. What are you thinking? Ramanujan just lined up the copper pots across the floor. And when he didn't get his curd rice and mango, he rolled in the monsoon mud. His grandfather tried to help. He held Ramanujan's finger and together they traced numbers in the rice. Anru, Arandu, Munru, his grandfather counted out loud in Tamil. One, two, three. Soon Ramanujan began to talk. What is small, he asked. He imagined the world with only one man before anyone was there to hear him speak. What is big? He looked up at the big blue space between clouds. <clears throat> at five years old, long hair tied up in a knot, white dhoti tied around his waist, he started school, just half a dozen boys on the front porch of a house. But when the teacher took no interest in his odd questions, Ramanujan grew bored. He tried again and again to sneak away. And I want you to take notice of those slates on the porch where his school was being held. And this is the last page I'm going to read. As he grew, he often thought about his grandmother's dream, which is what you missed. There was something out there beyond his tiny stucco house whispering. Was it calling him? Na na na, said the goats in the street. What else is small? Ramanujan wondered. He remembered the legend of the single egg that cracked open to reveal the entire universe. He thought about a mango. A mango is like an egg. It is just one thing. But if I chop it in two, then chop the half in two and keep on chopping, I get more and more bits on and on endlessly. 
to an infinity I could never ever reach. Yet when I put them back together, I still have just one mango. He loved this idea, small and big, each inside the other. If he could crack the number one open and find infinity, what secrets would he discover inside other numbers? It felt like he was setting out on a grand chase. So I'm gonna close with that. And what I really wanna do now is share with you um, the backstory behind this book, and then I will be back with you after that. I want to tell you the story of how I came to write this book. The book is a story of a little boy who lived over 100 years ago in South India and grew up to become one of the greatest mathematicians the world has ever known. Here, the little boy, Ramanujan, is only five years old. The story of the book begins for me too, when I was five years old. Now, when I was a little girl, I hated math in school. To me, math looked and sounded like this. The clock on my math class wall. But the math in my home was different. Math lived under the basement stairs in my father's tiny triangular office where he worked out his mathematical ideas and listened to Boogie Woogie Piano on his turntable. And drank black coffee. And wrote with blue ink on a pad of paper. Here he's writing down mock theta functions. But wait, who's that? Oh, it looks like the mock turtle. Better get him out of here. He can be quite troublesome. Actually, you better remember this guy. He'll be important later. Anyway, in my house, mathematics smelled like coffee, sounded like the blues, and looked like blue ink on a page. So even when I was growing up, I knew that mathematics was beautiful, and this was a lie. Back to when I was five years old, we moved to another house. But an even more amazing thing happened that year. We took a trip to England that would change our lives forever. We were visiting the English number theorist, Lucy Slater. She had once studied with mathematicians who had been at Cambridge during Ramanujan's time. She told my father about some boxes of papers kept at Trinity College from the estate of number theorist G. N. Watson. So not expecting much, he went off to the Wren Library. He found the box and opened it up. Very quickly, he realized that he was looking at something incredible. The work Ramanujan had been doing on his deathbed over 50 years ago. And here were the mock theta functions. Remember those? This was amazing. Mock theta functions, which Ramanujan had probably named for Lewis Carroll's mock turtle, were what Ramanujan had written about in his last letter to England as he lay dying. My father is probably the only living mathematician who could have recognized them, for no one was thinking about mock theta functions at the time, and my father had written his dissertation on them. So he took the box to the head librarian and paid 20 pounds to have it copied. But he said he would have taken a second mortgage on his house to get those pages. All I remember from that trip is punting on the River Cam that goes right in front of the Wren Library, and my father standing on the back of the boat with the punting pole, getting it stuck in the bottom of the river and still gripping the pole as the boat drifted away, falling in. But now that splashing in the river has taken on mythic significance for me, as if it represents that moment when my father reached across cultures, continents, time, to connect with the mind of Ramanujan. 
Since then, he has traveled back and forth to India, met with the Prime Minister, collaborated extensively with other mathematicians to bring this lost notebook to light, which has now had implications for space travel, black holes, and the computer revolution. So as you can see, I've been thinking about this story ever since I was a little girl. And since then, I've studied his mathematics in graduate school. I've gone to India and England to visit the places he lived. I've taught his mathematics to other students. And finally, I've written this book. It's the story of a child, like a lot of kids, who hated math in school. See, here he is running away from his teachers and classmates. But on his own, he loved numbers and all the beautiful patterns they make. So I hope someday you will read this book and discover not only Ramanujan's story, but the beauty of mathematics, and realize that math is not just a clock on your classroom wall, but is something beautiful waiting to be discovered. And hopefully this guy won't bother you too much. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, you might hear my bird squawking over there. Um, so I wanted to show you a couple ideas inspired by the book. So the first is this. So you see, this is actually a slate that I got in India when I was there. Um, and what you see on it is what's called a magic square, which is one of the things that Ramanujan does in the book. And what makes this square magic? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, you use all the numbers between one and nine. You see there's nine spaces in that square. Um, so you have to use each of the numbers from one to nine exactly one time, no repeats and nothing left out. Secondly, you have to do it in such a way that every row, every column, every diagonal adds up to the magic number for this particular grid, this three by three grid, which is 15. And if you start checking it, 8 plus 1 is 9, plus 6 is 15, 8 plus 5 is 13, plus 2 is 15, 4 plus, 9, 4 plus 5 is 9, plus 6 is 15, etc. And it will work out perfectly. So what I want to do is flip this over and show you how to do this on a blank grid. All right, so I'm going to grab my chalk here. So what you want to do, and this is a general method that will work even for bigger grids. So you might want to try this with, say, a five by five, but it only works for odd sizes. So this is three by three. It would only work for, say, five by five, seven by seven. So we start with a one right in the center. And now the rule is you go up and over. Notice we can't go up. So you just bump to the other side as if that was, so you're just extending this column by going around to the other side of it, okay? So we go up and over, we write a two, okay? We go up and over, we write a three, we go up and over and oh no, there's something there. So now we need another part of our rule, and that is if there's something occupying the cell that you wanna put the number in, you go down one instead. So we put the four there, up and over five, up and over six, up, and over, doesn't work, seven, okay, up and over eight, whoops, eight, up and over nine. Okay, so now you can check it. Actually, I think that is exactly the same one that we got here, so we know that's correct. All right, so that's a, it's called the staircase method for filling out a magic square. So I encourage you to try that for, say, a four by four. And there the magic number will be different because you're using the numbers one through 16. So you also get to discover what that magic number would be. So now there's a couple ways to generate new magic squares. One is to um, add a number. <clears throat> Just pick a number and add it to everything in there. That will work. So we'll say the first one is to add a number. The second is to multiply by a number. So how am I gonna say that? I guess most kids use an X, right? Or a star to indicate multiplication. You multiply by a number. Another is to rotate or flip this grid. So try rotations as if you're just spinning it or flipping it. 
and then you should be able to get more grids. There's also, there's lots of other ways that you can stick with the same set of numbers and transform this and still have a magic square. So you might look for those methods. And now you see the cool thing in mathematics is if you discover your own method, you can give it a name. And you can usually, it's usually named for you. So it could be the so-and-so method using your last name. So I wanna teach you one last thing that is inspired by my book. And it's just inspired by this word, infinity. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to make what are called infinity bracelets. And I'm using the word infinity, as you will see, very loosely. So I'm going to shift the camera so you can see me doing this craft. Okay, I wanna show you how to make Mobius strips. So Mobius strips are named for somebody whose last name was Mobius, and that's one of the cool things in mathematics. If you discover something, you get to name it after yourself. Um, so let me show you what you need to do initially. Just get any piece of paper. It does not have to be construction paper. It could just be a piece of white paper, but you want a certain amount of length. So computer paper is fine. And you wanna just take a ruler and mark off just even sections like this. Okay, you might wanna mark off a couple so you can have a couple different strips. And then you're just gonna cut those with some scissors to make strips. Okay, so it's as simple as that. And I am being kind of careful about these straight lines, but you certainly don't have to be. You can just sort of eyeball it and make a strip like this. The second thing I like to do when I'm making a Mobius strip is I like to change the two different sides. So I like to take a pen and just maybe give stripes or some pattern to one of the sides. Or you can use paper that has two different sides, like scrapbooking paper. All right, so now this is how to actually make the strip. So you bend it around as if you're going to make a circle. All right, and a lot of times people associate Mobius strips with infinity, and I'll show you why in just a second. But one of the things they say mistakenly is that a Mobius strip goes on forever and ever. Well, it does in the same way that a circle does, right? So a circle goes around and around. So a circle in some sense is just as infinite as a Mobius strip. But here's how to turn a circle into a Mobius strip. We turn that one half turn. So let me show you that one more time. You take this side, which is where you would be making the circle, and you just turn it over, all right? And now at this point, you need a piece of tape. So we just take some tape and bend that right around. You might wanna, it's really important to get this a nice seal because we're gonna do some cutting in a little while. So you wanna make sure that's really well taped. Um, if you don't use a long enough piece in the beginning like I didn't, you want to put a couple pieces on. All right, so let's think about how this is different from the circle. So imagine going along this, just follow the path, and you'll start noticing something really interesting about this. We are actually covering all the surface area front and back of our original paper, right? Without ever changing sides. So what we have created is something that has a single side, and if you follow the edge, a single edge, a single continuous edge. Okay, so now we're gonna do some cutting. So the first cut we're gonna make, and I really hope you try this at home, is to cut right down the center. Before you actually do it though, you might wanna predict what will you get when you make this cut. So we're cutting right down the center of our loop. And so, oops, I went a little off track there. But you're gonna meet right back up with that center cut. All right, so you ready? It makes one continuous loop, which I think is pretty fantastic. This thing is not a Mobius strip though. You might wanna examine it, examine it to see how many um, turns it actually has in it. The second cut we're gonna make is going to be closer to this edge than the center line. So maybe about a third of the way across. And you wanna to try to stay that same distance from that edge. And again, it's fun to predict what you're gonna get. You might remember that this object, this crazy object that we've created 
has only one edge. So that might give you some idea. Now notice when we come back around, we're not gonna meet our previous cut. We're gonna go right on by it and go all the way around a second time, right? So you have to do twice as much cutting when you do it this way, which is just sort of mind boggling in and of itself. We get to there and we finally meet up with our cut and now here we go. We have created two interlocked loops. This one, this little one, is still a Mobius strip. And this, you'll have to figure out what that is, but you see it is actually connected to itself. So that's really cool. Now another thing I love to do with Mobius strips is to make Mobius bracelets. So you just take a piece, you take a duct tape roll like this and pull off a length of tape and then fold it over very carefully on itself to one edge meeting the other. And if you've ever worked with duct tape, you know that is much easier said than done because it tends to stick to everything. So I've already made one, so you can see the finished product there, but what you're gonna do is take the two ends as if you're gonna make a circle, turn it over, take another piece of tape, and then just of the same size, the same kind, the same color, or you could do a contrasting color if you want, and then just loop this around to connect your two sides. I feel like I went too far there. Just You wanna make sure it'll wrap around to the other side so you can curl around and seal that off. And then you have a beautiful little Mobius bracelet and you can be a, a little math nerd and walk around and people will ask you why your bracelet looks like that and you can tell them all about awesome Mobius strips. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna show you with Mobius strips is using a clear piece of paper. And this is actually um, just a page protector. The nice thing about that is once you cut your strip, um, so I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but once I cut my strip, you're gonna see that on this side, it's connected so you can make a really long strip. So what I've done is I just took an old oatmeal container and I put my Mobius strip around that. And now you wanna use a dry erase marker and write words on it to see what happens. Okay, when you turn around your Mobius strip. Okay, so we have Pop and Mom. Now, when we go around, notice I'm going to make sure we still always stay on the side we're on, and I want you to see, which means we're always going to stay on the single side of the Mobius strip, right? And I want you to see what happens. We now have Bob and Wow. So essentially, what happens? when you turn around and stay on that same side on your Mobius strip, is that you're taking these two words, right? Oops, I will reverse them this time, but it doesn't matter. And you're just turning them upside down, right? You're seeing what would happen if you looked at them from the other side, okay? Um, and so I did, what I did is make one, I used permanent marker on this so it would stay there, but I made some words that stay consistent if you flip them upside down. So think infinite. Notice I had to make a sort of strange looking F there to make this work out. But one thing my daughter and I were doing is we were creating a language which we called Mubish. So we wrote out all the letters, okay, and then we tried it with lowercase too, and then we turned them upside down and we saw what kind of letters do we get? Do they stay the same? Could we write them in another way? Like if you write an A like this, or if you write an A like this, you might get some interesting things that will help you when they turn upside down. So you can practice out writing, writing out the entire alphabet and then make cool words or stories even that will either stay the same or change in interesting ways as you go around your loop. All right, thank you so much for watching. Um, I really hope you'll get a chance to read this book at some point. Um, again, I just wanna remind you who the illustrator is because he's an amazing guy. Um, and I will have lots of resources posted on my website. So you can just go to www, Amy, and then A-L-Z, amyalls.com. And I will have lots of resources, more little videos that show you mathematical ideas inspired by the book. So thank you so much.